this evening. I thought there was going to be a showing of uh, Merchants of Doubt, and I was going to do some Q&A after it. But I guess I'm also supposed to give a talk. So I, I quickly put something together, um, and it will not be a polished presentation, but I think I can make my bottom line clear. Um, and how can I move charts? I just raise a hand, I, I guess. Okay. Um, you know, the, um, uh, there are three uh, potential injustices. Could I go back one? Uh, so I, I first, I want, I need to decide whether we're talking about climate justice and government honesty or injustice and dishonesty. Um, okay, now the, the, uh, go to the next one, please. Yeah, you, I'm sure you realize the, the biggest uh, injustice is the one intergenerational issue. Our, our parents did not know that they were causing a problem for future generations. But we can only pretend that we don't know. Um, that's why we have to have policies that will actually address this. And that's why we have to look at what they're talking about at this conference. The second one is uh, North-South, where um, I'm not sure I have a chart or not, but most of the most of the emissions have been from the North, but the biggest impacts are at low latitudes. I even have a paper that's in. Uh, in the process of being published, and so I can't really show the results, but we show that the, the changes are much larger, actually, at low latitudes. And you're already feeling effects, and that is um, making it actually uncomfortable to live at the lowest latitudes. And uh, so that's this, a second uh, area of injustice. And then, of course, it's one species is causing all of the change. Uh, millions of other species, we potentially can cause the extermination of a quarter to a half of the other species by the end of this century, according to the last IPCC report, and, and there's a fairly good basis for that uh, estimate. Okay, let's go to the next one. So, what I'm gonna say, if it's not sufficiently coherent, you can, I would suggest that you look at the most recent document that I sent out, which I think was called Isolation of 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. Um, now, go to the next one. Um, and let me just mention one, I'll just show one figure from a paper which is also in the process of being um, reviewed and, and published. Uh, what we show is that the ice melt coming from Greenland and Antarctica will have a very big effect. And it's not included in the IPCC models. Um, and uh, we argue that the rate of ice, of freshwater discharge from these ice sheets is a very nonlinear process which is better characterized by a doubling time rather than a more linear a process. And when we look at the data, the, the uh, period for which we have accurate data for the mass loss from Greenland and Antarctica, it's like a decadal doubling time, which would mean that within four to five decades, you've got multimeter sea level rise. And the, the um, surface manifestation of that is a cooling around uh, Antarctica, and that uh, the fresh water makes the vertical column of the ocean more stable. So the usual mechanism by which the ocean, southern ocean, brings heat up 
which is expelled to space, is cut off by this freshwater lens. And instead, the heat melts the base, the, the uh, ice shelves, the tongues of ice that come out from Antarctica into the ocean. Now, we observe, in fact, this is happening, that the ice shelves are melting faster and faster. And we also observe that it's beginning to cool around the region where the ice discharge is the largest. And um, it's less certain how soon the North Atlantic will uh, begin to cool. In fact, it, it's the last few years it has cooled, but we don't know if that's an oscillation or if that's really the beginning of the effect of the fresh water coming off of Greenland. But that, if we let that happen, that uh, the fresh water become at a rate that's big enough to shut down the North Atlantic deep water formation, the way Wally Broker hypothesized decades ago, then all hell breaks loose because you're cooling the northern latitudes while the tropical latitudes are continuing to get warmer because of the greenhouse gases. And that increased temperature gradient drives much stronger storms. Uh, let's go to the next one. Now, you know, the current emissions, they'll say, well, China is now the biggest emitter. But the climate change is not caused by current emissions. It's caused by the cumulative emissions over time. And those cumulative emissions, the United States is responsible for more than a quarter. Europe is responsible for more than a quarter. China for 10%, India 3%, and so on. But that even is an exaggeration of the effect of the developing countries. Because have the next one. Uh, if you look at it on a per capita basis, uh, United Kingdom is first, and the United States almost the same, and Germany is third. But China is an order of magnitude smaller, a contribution to climate change. And India is barely visible. Their, their, their contribution is so small. Can I have the next one? Uh, yeah. Um, and we're, we are threatening uh, many species for many different reasons. That humans are just sort of taking over the planet. But if you combine that with shifting climate zones, which we will have if we continue on business as usual with fossil fuel emissions, we will cause uh, the extermination of a large number of species. Can I have the next one? Uh, now, we can actually quantify what is needed. If we want to uh, stabilize climate, we need to have, you need to restore the planet's energy balance. What will you do when you add CO2 and other greenhouse gases to the atmosphere is you reduce the heat radiation to space because they absorb infrared heat radiation. So there's more energy then coming in from the sun than there is energy going out, and so the planet gets warmer. But we can now, but the planet has only partially responded to the gases we've put up in the atmosphere. And we can now measure how far it is out of balance because uh, different nations of the world cooperated in spreading um, more than 3,000 Argo floats around the ocean they dive down into the ocean because this heat has to go into the ocean. The atmosphere is very thin. It has a very small heat capacity and the continents have a very low thermal conductivity so the thermal wave only penetrates a few tens of meters. So most of the energy goes into the ocean. We can now measure that. The, could I have the next one? The planet is out of balance. There's more. Uh, the, the, the heat content of the ocean is increasing. It tells us that we've only felt about half of the climate change due to the gases that are already up there. And we're still increasing more and more. If we, it, it also tells us what we would have to do if we wanted to stabilize climate. And we've already increased the temperature back to the maximum and slightly above the maximum of the Holocene, which is the current uh, climate 10,000 year climate period that we've been living in, that civilization developed in. So if we want to avoid shooting way out of the Holocene, we need to restore the planet's energy balance. 
Well, once we know that it's out of balance by about six tenths of a watt per meter squared, that tells us that other things being equal, we would have to reduce the CO2 from 400 parts per million to about 350 parts per million, which is the source of Bill McKibben's uh, name of his organization. Uh, that's possible because the ocean and the biosphere and the soil will take up some of that CO2 if we give it time, provided we reduce our emissions fast enough. Uh, could I have the next one? And what it means is that we can only afford to burn a small amount of additional uh, fossil fuels. We've only burned a small fraction of the total fossil fuels in the ground. And the science is crystal clear. We can't burn all of that stuff without creating eventually an ice-free planet and sea level 250 feet higher. You know, so we can, we know that we can only burn a, a relatively small amount of additional uh, fossil fuels. Can I have the next one? Uh, the next chart. But what's actually happening? is that not only are we continuing to burn, this is just the rate at which we're burning. We're, uh, this is energy, but it's mostly fossil fuels. It's almost all um, coal, oil, and gas. Uh, could I have the next one? So, so here's the, the fundamental problem is, and, um, and by the way, I. I've learned, you know, I, I worked for NASA for some decades, and the, the highest levels of NASA would always tell me when I went to Washington, make sure you only talk about the science. Don't say anything about policy. That's not your business. Um, what I learned finally was um, the, the reason is that they want to make decisions which are not rational if you're really looking out after the, you know, for, for the good of everybody on the long term. Uh, and I think that scientists can look at problems. I think try, scientists are trained to be objective. If, so I've, uh, I've uh, <laughs> decided to ignore <laughs> Uh, that issue, but in this, and looking at this problem rationally, it's it's very clear. The fundamental problem is that we're going to keep burning fossil fuels as long as they appear to be the cheapest energy. These uh, developing countries, uh, they have just as much right as we did to to burn fossil fuels to lift their people out of poverty, uh, but. Fossil fuels are not really the cheapest energy because they don't include their cost to society. And so to address the problem, we need to add a fee to fossil fuels. And you can't do that instantly. It would cause economic chaos if you suddenly uh, quadrupled the price of fossil fuels or something. But you can gradually increase the, uh, the uh, a fee on fossil fuels. Um, so can I have the next one? And uh, furthermore, I argue that that uh, fee should be, the money that's collected should be distributed to the public, an equal amount to every legal resident of the country. That way it actually spurs the economy. And it, an economy is more efficient if the prices are honest. Right now, fossil fuel prices are not honest. They don't, they're partially subsidized, but mainly they're just not paying their cost to society. The human health impact of air pollution and water pollution alone would make a large increase in the price of fossil fuels. You have to pay the bill yourself if your child gets asthma. Uh, 